This is the Basic Nutrition and Nutrition Education module. My name is Kimberly Prezioso. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist and a certified lactation educator. I'm also a matador through and through, having completed my bachelor's, master's, as well as my internship program here at Cal State Northridge. I recently celebrated 25 years as an RDN, and although I have worked in public health for about 15 years, I took a break to raise my family. Previously, I was the Director of Nutrition Education and Training at the Special Supplemental Program for Women, Infants, and Children, commonly known as the WIC Program for Northeast Valley Health Corporation. One of my primary responsibilities was to coordinate and develop nutrition education curriculum for our WIC participants, as well as create nutrition and health education training programs for our professional and paraprofessional staff. I also helped develop the dietetic internship rotation through the WIC program prior to it being transformed under the direction of Dr. Annette Besnellian in the Family and Consumer Science Department. My scope of practice has always revolved around the prenatal and pediatric period of the life cycle. I currently am at Northeast Valley Health Corporation again as a high-risk dietitian for the WIC program and am the medical nutrition therapist for a San Fernando High School's based clinic. I'm also privileged to be a part of a new grant called Champions for Change Healthy Communities Initiative as the Public Relations Coordinator. In this grant, we work to make the healthy choice the easy choice for today's families and aim to reduce obesity by helping families make simple yet strategic lifestyle changes like choosing to eat more vegetables and fruits and be more active. We also promote school wellness, edible community gardens, and are addressing food insecurity. You are welcome to contact me if you have any questions regarding this lecture or the field of dietetics. One of my favorite quotes is, if you do not smoke or drink excessively, your diet can influence your long-term health prospects more than any other action you might take. Well, good nutrition during pregnancy improves the chances of having a healthy baby, and it may even reduce the risk of certain chronic conditions in your child long after he has grown. Now, many women begin pregnancy with shortfalls of nutrients central to a healthy pregnancy, including iron, calcium, and brain-building fats. Well, the good news? Pregnancy and lactation can be times when a woman is more receptive to positively changing lifestyle patterns. And that's a good thing, because never in a woman's life is nutrition so important as when she's pregnant and nursing. Now, let's review the course objectives. After successful completion of this course, students will identify how a lactating woman's diet is different from a healthy diet for a woman of that same age, including special considerations for lactating teen moms. We'll identify levels of individual nutrients on lactating women's diets that affects the quantity of those nutrients in the breast milk. You'll learn how to counsel mothers in determining whether particular foods might affect breast milk and evaluate the need for referral to health professionals. So basically, you'll be describing nutrition education, and here I'm just going over the bullet points. Understand the five key principles of the dietary guidelines. You'll be able to list three macronutrients and three micronutrients. You'll understand the main function of carbohydrates, as well as proteins and fats. You'll understand the different forms of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And you'll identify three sources of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. By the end of the session, uh, you'll be able to identify and understand the main function of at least three sources of vitamin B12, folate, vitamin A, D, E, and K, as well as calcium, iodine, and iron. By the end of the session, you will also be able to list each food group, describe the quantity of each food group equivalency, and understand the dietary reference intakes. So in this module, we will again cover nutrition education and basic nutrients. And like I mentioned earlier, you are always welcome to shoot me an email if you do have any questions. So food. It's one small word with so much meaning behind it. We all know that food is the fuel that keeps the body alive, and not just alive, but can allow it to flourish or deteriorate, to prosper or to weaken. Now, food provides fuel, building blocks for growth and maintenance. It provides substances that act to control body processes. But besides that, eating can be one of the greatest pleasures of living. To eat for good health does not mean you must miss out on the pleasure of eating. 
and eating for good health can and should mean truly enjoying delicious and healthy food, which improves your chances at thriving, not just surviving. You may also notice as you eat healthier, your body craves more nutritious food that satisfies the body. Pregnancy and lactation are critical periods during which maternal nutrition and lifestyle choices are major influences on the health of mother and child. Inadequate levels of key nutrients due to low maternal body reserves and insufficient food intake during crucial periods of fetal development may lead to reprogramming during pregnancy, predisposing the infant to chronic conditions in later life, and it may also lead to less than optimum fetal growth or even death. Improving the well-being of mothers, infants, and children is key to the health of the next generation. Unfortunately, pregnancy and lactation are times during a woman's life when she is more motivated to make positive lifestyle changes. And as educators, it is critical that you have a basic understanding of sound nutrition principles and are able to effectively convey those guidelines. It is important to realize that many individuals have limited, incomplete, or inaccurate nutrition and health information. Currently, much of the vast amount of health and nutrition information is incorrect or incomplete and is filtered through limited or false beliefs. Simply put, it is not evidence-based. Media's influence on consumer practices is substantial, and oftentimes what people think are health messages are, in fact, product advertisement. And the influence of marketing on young children has been widely established. There is serious money involved in food marketing, and we could spend an hour on those principles alone. But suffice it to say that unbiased, evidence-based nutrition information is critical for the well-being of today's family, but is often difficult for the public to distinguish the good from the bad. And as mentioned earlier, women are often more responsive to improving the nutrition status during pregnancy and lactation. They want to give their children the best possible outcome. Capturing these teachable moments can lead to lifelong positive changes and should be exploited, but exploited in a positive sense. As educators, take advantage of this impressionable period of time. I realize that some of these adjectives are generally viewed as negative, but as educators, oftentimes these pivotal moments, these susceptible moments are significant. And as educators, consideration as to the background and experience of your client is also critical. And having an understanding of their knowledge, belief, skills, culture, food practices, and health history is critical to providing solid nutrition and health information. As educators, your own background comes into play. However, nutrition recommendations should always be evidence-based and unbiased. Personal experience, while it may contribute significantly to trust and competency, and even add credibility to education, must always support solid dietary theories. The United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, issues updated dietary guidelines about every five years. And these guidelines, the latest of which were released in 2015, are the foundation for our nutrition recommendations today. Intended for policymakers and health professionals, these dietary guidelines are designed to help Americans eat a healthier diet. The eighth edition of the dietary guidelines outlines how people can improve their overall eating patterns, the complete combination of foods and drinks in their diet. This edition offers five overarching principles and a number of key recommendations with specific nutritional targets and dietary limits. Let's talk about some of the tools we have at our disposal, starting off with the RDA or the recommended daily allowance. Now the RDA is an estimated amount of a nutrient or calories per day considered necessary for the maintenance of good health by the Food and Nutrition Board of the National Research Council, National Academy of Sciences. And we'll talk about this a little more later on. Now the DRIs or dietary reference intake is the general term for a set of reference values used to plan and assess nutrient intakes of healthy people. These values, which vary by age and gender, include recommended dietary allowance, the RDAs, the average daily level of intake sufficient to meet nutrient requirements of nearly all, around 97 to 90% of healthy people. Now, a BMI, a BMI is a person's weight in kilograms divided by his or her height in meters squared. The National Institutes of Health now defines normal weight, 
overweight and obesity according to BMI rather than the traditional height and weight charts. Overweight is a BMI of 27.3 or more for women and 27.8 or more for men. And BMI just, again, stands for body mass index. Now, UL, that stands for upper limits. We all know the saying, if some is good, more is better. Well, that's not always the case. The tolerable upper level intake, or UL, is the highest level of daily nutrient intake that is likely to pose no risk of adverse health effects to almost all individuals in the general population. As intake increases above the UL, the risk of adverse effects increases. Now, over the past century, deficiencies of essential nutrients have dramatically decreased. Many infectious diseases have been conquered, and the majority of the U.S. population can now anticipate a long and productive life. However, at the same time, rates of chronic diseases, many of which are related to poor quality diet and physical inactivity, have increased. About half of all American adults have one or more preventable diet-related chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and overweight and or obesity. However, a large body of evidence now shows that healthy eating patterns and regular physical activity can help people achieve and maintain good health and reduce the risk of chronic disease throughout all stages of the lifespan. The 2015 to 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans reflects this evidence through its recommendations. Why do we look to the Dietary Guidelines as a foundation? Well, the 1990 National Nutrition Monitoring and Related Research Act states that every five years, the U.S. Departments of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Agriculture must jointly publish a report containing nutritional and dietary information and guidelines for the general public. The law requires that the dietary guidelines be based on the preponderance of current scientific and medical knowledge. The 2015 and 2020 edition of the Dietary Guidelines builds from the 2010 edition with re revisions based on the scientific report of the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee and consideration of federal agency and public comments. Earlier editions of the Dietary Guidelines were required to go through the same exhaustive process. And as I mentioned earlier, the Dietary Guidelines is responsible and designed for professionals to help all individuals ages two years and older and their families consume a healthy and nutritionally adequate diet. The information and dietary guidelines is used in developing federal food, nutrition, and health policies and programs. It's also a basis for federal nutrition education materials designed for the public, as well as for nutrition education components of HHS and USDA food programs. Basically, it's designed for use by policymakers and nutrition and health professionals. Businesses, schools, community groups, media, the food industry, and state and local governments also look to these guidelines for direction. So the 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines provides five overarching guidelines that encourage healthy eating patterns that recognize individuals need to make shifts in their food and beverage choices to achieve a healthy pattern and acknowledge that all segments of our society have a role to play in supporting healthy choices. These guidelines also embody the idea that a healthy eating pattern is not a rigid set of rules, but rather an adaptive framework in which individuals can enjoy foods that meet their personal, cultural, and traditional preferences, as well as fit within their budget. Several examples of healthy eating patterns that translate and integrate the recommendations in overall healthy ways to eat are provided and are the basis for today's prenatal and lactation information. Healthy eating is one of the most powerful tools we have to increase positive outcomes during pregnancy, lactation, and beyond. And the path to improving health through nutrition is to follow a healthy eating pattern that's right for each person. Eating patterns are the com combination of foods and drinks eaten over time. A healthy eating pattern is adaptable to a person's taste preferences, traditions, culture, and budget. Now, what do you think a healthy eating pattern would include? A healthy eating pattern includes a variety of vegetables, dark green, red and orange, legumes such as beans and peas, starchy and other vegetables, fruits, especially the whole fruit, grains, at least half of which are whole, 
fat-free or low-fat dairy, including milk, yogurt, cheese, and our fortified soy beverages, a variety of protein foods, including seafood, lean meats and poultry, eggs, legumes, soy products, and nuts and seeds, as well as oils, including those from plants, such as canola, corn, olive, peanut, safflower, soybean, and sunflower. Oils also are naturally present in nuts, seeds, seafood, olives, and avocados. And I can't emphasize enough that the dietary guidelines are an essential tool when providing recommendations to clients. And here is our first tester knowledge slide. And um, just for the question here, so what do the following abbreviations mean? I'm going to pause for about 10 seconds, let you answer those, and then the answers will fly up on the screen. So the five key principles, they include follow a healthy eating pattern across the lifespan, focusing on variety, nutrient density, and amount of foods, limiting calories from added sugars and added saturated fats and reducing sodium intake, a shift to healthier food and beverage choices, and supporting healthy eating patterns for all. And we'll circle back and discuss these in greater detail after we have covered the basic principles of nutrition. So while pregnancy is not the time to lose weight, women should not use their expanding bellies as a reason to eat more than is necessary. The amount of food a woman needs during pregnancy depends on a number of things, including her body mass index, or BMI, her before pregnancy weight, the rate at which she gains weight, her age, and her appetite. All pregnant women should eat a variety of nutrient-rich foods each day, and it may also be necessary to take a vitamin and mineral supplement. Many women start off pregnancy with an overweight or obese BMI, and many gain more weight than is healthy during their pregnancy. Research shows that the risk of problems during pregnancy and delivery is lowest when weight gain is kept within a healthy range. Obesity during pregnancy is risky for both mom and child, with some risks including gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension or high blood pressure, a cesarean delivery, birth defects, and even fetal death. And that was not an exhaustive list of obesity-related prenatal outcomes. More and more research is looking at the risks of obesity extensively. And if a woman is obese during pregnancy, it also significantly raises the chance her child will be obese later in life. And for further study, as mentioned in your text, you can access perinatology.com for more detailed recommendations of key nutrients during pregnancy. And we will be discussing this in length during our Nutrition During Pregnancy module. The most important takeaway is that high quality nutrition leads to high quality health. So let's dive in. There are two categories of nutrients, macronutrients and micronutrients. Macro means our bodies need a relatively large amount. Macronutrients offer calories and therefore provide energy. They include carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Then there are micronutrients. Micro meaning our bodies need a relatively small amount. These have no calories and therefore do not provide energy, although they do perform other vital functions. The micronutrients consist of vitamins, minerals, and water. Carbohydrates. So think of carbohydrates as raw material that powers your body. You need them to make sugar for energy. They are the main source of energy for all body functions and activity, and carbohydrates assist in the regulation of protein and fat metabolism. So the forms of carbohydrates Carbs come in two types, simple and complex. All carbohydrates are made of links or strings of sugar, and the links are either simple, meaning short, 
or complex, meaning longer. And both simple and complex carbohydrates are turned to glucose or blood sugar in the body and are used as energy. And glucose is used in the cells of the body and the brain. And any unused glucose is stored in the liver and muscles as glycogen for use later. Now, fiber is another form of a carbohydrate that does not contribute calories to the diet. We just don't have the enzyme to break down fiber although it does benefit us in many, many ways. And again, we'll discuss that um, in detail later. This is just to help you visualize what a carbohydrate molecule looks like. So glucose is just a chain of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen molecules. Lactose, which is a disaccharide, or two sugars linked together, in this case, glucose and galactose, um, is, again, just made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Glycogen, on the far right is a complex carbohydrate, and that is just a long string of sugars, you know, strung together. So during pregnancy, the daily recommended intake, or DRI, is around 175 grams a day. And that means roughly 45 to 65% of a woman's diet should come from carbs. And for breastfeeding moms, they should aim for about 210 grams a day. And carbohydrates are four calories per gram. So what's the difference between simple and complex carbohydrates beside their molecular length? Well, simple carbs are like quick burning fuels. They are rapidly broken down into sugar in our digestive system that can lead to a sudden rise in blood sugar level, followed by a rapid drop, which can lead to hunger cravings. And simple carbohydrates or sugars occur naturally in foods such as fruit or fruit juice and milk, and the sugar in fruit is fructose, while the sugar in milk is lactose. And just a little trick is whenever you hear ose, just think sugar. They can also be added from refined sources such as table sugar, which is sucrose, or even natural sources like honey. Because they are rapidly broken down into sugar in our digestive system, leading to a sudden boost in blood sugar level, followed by a rapid crash leading to hunger cravings, they're oftentimes given a bad rep. And while it's true that foods have been processed with added sugars, they generally aren't as healthy a choice, simple carbs can occur naturally in some foods that are part of a balanced diet. For example, most milk and other dairy products contain lactose or milk sugar. And fruits are also a healthy choice. They've got fiber in them, which helps slow the breakdown of sugar. Plus, most are a good source of nutrients like fiber, vitamin C, and potassium. And nutrition labels offer an easy way to spot added sugar, the source of simple cards that you want to cut back on. Again, just look for the words that end in OS, OSC. Other names you might see include one that we mentioned earlier, fructose, but there's also dextrose and maltose. And keep in mind that the higher up they appear in the ingredient list, the more added sugar that food has. And we'll cover uh, food labels a little bit later on. So sources of complex carbohydrates include breads, grains, and cereals, beans, lentils, and legumes, pasta, rice, and popcorn, and starchy veggies. Uh, in this case, you can think autumn, like sweet potatoes, squash, and pumpkins. Now, grains are divided into two subgroups, whole grains and refined grains. Whole grains contain the entire kernel, the bran, the germ, and the endosperm. A refined grain is the term used to refer to grains that are not whole because they're missing one or more of their three key parts. For example, white flour and white rice are refined grains because both have had their bran and germ removed, leaving only the endosperm. Refining a grain removes about a quarter of the protein and half to two-thirds or more of a variety of quality nutrients. And the Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommends making half of the grains you eat whole. So try and use whole grains instead of refined grain product at least half of the time. So fiber is found in fresh, canned, frozen, or dried fruits, fresh, canned, frozen, or cooked vegetables, whole grains, whole grain breads, cereals, crackers, and muffins, corn, including corn tortillas and popcorn, cold cereals, including 100% bran cereal, shredded wheat, puffed wheat cereals, cooked grains such as brown rice and barley, beans, legumes and nuts, and wheat germ. 
So a note about fiber. Fiber is a complex carbohydrate. However, again, our body just does not have the enzyme necessary to digest it. So this is a good thing because foods containing fiber have three primary functions. First of all, they add a sense of fullness or satiety to foods. They also assist in the control of blood glucose, blood cholesterol, and other nutrients. They also alleviate constipation and maintain regularity. Fiber comes in two varieties, both beneficial to health. Soluble fiber, which dissolves in water, can help lower glucose levels as well as help lower blood cholesterol. Foods with soluble fiber include oatmeal, nuts, beans, lentils, apples, and blueberries. Insoluble fiber, which does not dissolve in water, can help food move through the digestive system. This promotes regularity and helps prevent constipation. Foods with insoluble fibers include wheat, whole wheat bread, whole grain couscous, brown rice, legumes, carrots, cucumbers, and tomatoes. The best sources of fiber, again, are whole grain foods, fresh fruits and veggies, legumes, and nuts. So now we are on our next set of test your knowledge slides. And again, I'll ask the question and then give you a few seconds to answer. So how are simple carbohydrates like quick burning fuels? So basically, they are rapidly broken down into sugar in our digestive system that can lead to a sudden rise in blood sugar level, followed by a rapid drop, which may lead to hunger cravings. Why is fiber important? Fiber is a complex carbohydrate. However, our body simply does not have the enzyme necessary to digest it. This is a good thing because foods containing fiber have three primary functions. They add a sense of fullness or satiety to foods. They assist in the control of blood glucose, blood cholesterol, and other nutrients. They alleviate constipation and maintain regularity. Now we'll move on to our next macronutrient, protein. Protein is an essential part of every cell in your body, the largest portion existing in muscle tissue. Protein's primary function is to act like building blocks for the body, especially during key periods of growth and development, like during pregnancy, breastfeeding, infancy, and childhood. It is key to the formation of the body's internal organs, as well as for muscles, blood, skin, hair, and nails. It is essential for the formation of hormones and vital for sexual development and milk production during lactation. Protein is also the only source the body has for nitrogen. However, protein can also be used as an energy source. So you may have heard this phrase before, like sparing protein. So carbohydrates spare protein from being used as energy when carbohydrates are present in an adequate amount for energy. They allow protein to function in its other significant roles. Now keep in mind that carbohydrates and fat cannot function as protein. Like carbohydrates, protein is a macronutrient, meaning that the body needs relatively large amounts of it. Unlike fat and carbohydrates, the body does not store protein and therefore has no reservoir to draw on when it needs a new supply. So protein is one of those nutrients that we hear so much misinformation about. From what we hear, you may assume that the solution is to eat protein all day long. People need less total protein than you might think. But we could all benefit from getting more protein from quality food sources. Like carbohydrates, protein is made up of long chains or strings of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, as well as nitrogen. Proteins are made up of amino acids. The body takes the amino acid and rearranges them into new proteins. The new proteins are then used by the body. The human body needs about 22 amino acids to make these strings or links. Uh, this amino acid happens to be taurine. So your body can convert some of these amino acids from other amino acids. These are non-essential. Essential amino acids must come from food. We can't make these. Another way to look at a protein is if it is complete or incomplete. Foods that contain all 22 amino acids are called 
complete proteins. Incomplete proteins are foods that lack or have extremely low amounts of any of the essential amino acids. So dietary sources of complete proteins are generally from animal sources and include meat like beef, chicken, turkey, seafood, or pork, eggs, milk, cheese. And these are considered to have a higher biological value because they are complete. Dietary sources of incomplete proteins are from plant sources and include beans, nuts, grains, and tofus. Incomplete proteins, when combined with other incomplete proteins, can sometimes offer a complete protein. For example, when you combine rice with lentils or rice with black-eyed peas, um, peanut butter sandwiches on whole wheat bread, if you have a bean taco or a tostada, uh, a slip, split pea soup with brown rice, uh, macaroni with enriched soy flour, maybe vegetable chili with cornbread, um, bean soup with breadsticks. These are all examples of incomplete proteins combining into complete proteins. You'll notice that I don't have these up on uh, the slide. These are just um, examples and um, more, of a, more of a detail than uh, what would be like a basic nutrition um, component. How much protein is enough? Well, we've all heard the myth that extra protein builds more muscle. In fact, the only way to build muscle is through exercise. Bodies need a modest amount of protein to function well, and extra protein isn't going to give you extra strength. So protein can also be split into two separate groups according to their primary mineral, calcium or iron. And although we will not go into great detail, iron deficiency anemia can be caused by either a lack of iron-rich foods, or a surplus of calcium-rich foods, or a combination of the two. Calcium and iron compete in the body, and if one consumes too much calcium, iron is less available. And if one consumes too much iron, calcium is less available. So the body is in a constant state of building and repair, and especially during critical times of growth and development. However, most individuals in the U.S. do consume adequate protein. High protein diets have gained a lot of popularity, but generally they are unnecessary. Extra calories, regardless of their source, will always lead to additional and unhealthy weight gain when eaten in excess of what is needed. Additionally, when extra calories are obtained from higher fat protein or non-lean sources, that can lead to an increased risk of heart disease. As long as sufficient protein is available to fix, repair, and build, extra protein just is not necessary. So protein needs are higher during times of growth and development, like pregnancy. And quality sources of protein, like I mentioned earlier, are key. So in terms of recommendations, when choosing protein, better sources of protein include calcium-rich protein like milk, cheese, or yogurt. Not only are dairy foods like milk, cheese, and yogurt excellent sources of protein, but they also contain valuable calcium, and many are fortified with vitamin D. Always choose skim or low-fat dairy to keep bones and teeth strong and to prevent osteoporosis. Okay. So iron-rich protein. Iron-rich protein is found in seafood, white meat poultry, pork tenderloin, lean beef, eggs, beans and lentils, and soy. So looking closely at seafood, and I'll be mentioning this in the Nutrition During Pregnancy lecture as well, Women who are pregnant want to avoid tilefish, shark, swordfish, and king mackerel. And that's just because uh, mercury may be present in those fish, and we want to err on the side of caution. We also want to limit white or albacore tuna to six ounces per week, uh, or the equivalent of that. Um, keeping in mind that, again, we're just erring on the side of caution. Now, seafood is generally an excellent source of protein because it's usually low in fat. Uh, fish such as salmon is a little higher in fat, but... That's the heart healthy kind with the omega-3 fatty acids. So white meat poultry, most of the time, stick to the white meat poultry for excellent lean protein. Now dark meat is a little higher in fat, and this doesn't mean that you should avoid it, just eat it with the knowledge that it's a little higher in fat. For example, some chefs prefer using the thigh just because it's a little more succulent and moist and flavorful. But for the most part, I would just um, advise sticking to more the white meat poultry for its lean um, quality. Also, the skin is loaded with a lot of saturated fat. So for the most part, it's a good practice to remove the skin before cooking. 
Now, pork tenderloin. This is a really versatile white meat, and it's about 31% leaner than it was 20 years ago. So this is another good choice um, for iron-rich protein. Lean beef has about two grams more saturated fat than a skinless chicken breast. So it's also a pretty good choice. And it's also an excellent source of zinc, iron, and vitamin B12. So eggs are one of the least expensive forms of protein. And the American Heart Association says that normal healthy adults can safely enjoy an egg a day. Plant sources of protein include beans and lentils. One half cup of beans can contain as much protein as an ounce of broiled steak. Plus, these nutritious foods are loaded with fiber uh, that will help keep you full for hours, uh, along with the other benefits that fiber has. Now soy, 50 grams of soy protein daily can help lower cholesterol by about 3%. Eating soy protein instead of sources of higher fat protein and maintaining a healthy diet uh, alongside that can be good for your heart. So before we move on to the next nutrient, um, just a few more thoughts about protein. So many new moms really struggle with time. Now in America, families struggle with time, college students struggle with time. We all have this battle against the clock. A few things to think about. So for protein on the go, um, a good rule of thumb would be to, if you don't have time for a meal, just grab a meal replacement drink, a cereal bar, or an energy bar. And though I don't recommend using these um, as a consistent part of you know, someone's diet, they are absolutely a great um, you know, go-to item just in case you're strapped for time. Just remember that a good rule of thumb when looking at any of these um, items, just check the label and make sure that the product contains at least six grams of protein and is low in sugar and fat. And this will make it more of a meal replacement than a candy bar type food. You can always have a few of those on hand just as quick fixes when time is short. And then for protein at breakfast. So breakfast can be another tough one for new moms. Research shows that including a source of protein, like an egg or a Greek yogurt, um, along with a high fiber grain like a whole wheat toast or a whole wheat bagel, it can help people feel full longer and eat less throughout the day. And a final word about protein rich foods, deli, luncheon meats and hot dogs should be heated to steaming if consumed during pregnancy. And all unpasteurized products like milk and certain soft cheeses should be avoided due to food safety concerns. And for clients of yours who might really enjoy um, unpasteurized soft cheeses, they do make um, in many markets pasteurized um, soft cheeses. So that's just an alternative, but definitely the unpasteurized products um, should, be, should be avoided. So another test your knowledge slide. Um, so what role does protein play in the body? So although it is an essential part of every cell in your body, protein's primary function is to act like the building blocks for the body, especially during key periods of growth and development, like during pregnancy, breastfeeding, infancy, and early childhood. It is key to the formation of the body's internal organs, as well as for muscles, blood, skin, hair, and nails. Moving on to our last macronutrient, fat. For decades, fat has been villainized. In the media, it often, okay, usually, tops the list of what to avoid. Now, in reality, there is much more to the story about fats. And the truth is we actually need fats and in fact can't live without them. Fats are a crucial part of a healthy diet. They supply essential fatty acids, have a real role in heart health, deliver fat soluble vitamins and are a concentrated source of fuel. In our diets, fat can even help with weight loss when used strategically. However, fat obviously does have a very real part in cardiovascular disease and obesity. The trouble is that the average mainstream American diet is higher in fat than what is recommended. Well, why? Well, first of all, fats are pretty tasty and our food supply is abundantly supplied with them. However, it doesn't make sense to blame the obesity epidemic on just one nutrient. Consuming more calories from all sources, fats, carbs, protein, and alcohol, more than you burn off, 
results in weight gain. It is pretty simple. Although not every calorie is created equal, if you eat more than you burn, you will gain weight. Too little physical activity in a diet high in calories, again from any source, weight gain. There are other factors that play into obesity as well um, that we can't ignore, like genetics, age, gender, and lifestyle. And eating too much fat does more than just expand our waistlines. America's decades-long infatuation with fat has helped to trigger an increase in the rates of type 2 diabetes, certain cancers, and heart disease. So the other issue with fat? Well, what type of fat is it? And again, this is where the good fat versus bad fat, Dr. Chuckle and Mr. Hyde challenge comes into play. Um, before we move on, just another um, snapshot of what a fat looks like. So like carbohydrates and protein, fats are made up of very long-chained um, fatty acids, long-chain molecules of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, and this molecule happens to be arachidonic acid and this is one of our superstars it's one of the omega-3 fatty acids and um, we will be spending time discussing this one but again just to um, you know give you just a really quick idea of what um, a fatty acid um, does look like so moving on um, fats are a concentrated source of energy and they offer more than twice as many calories per gram than either carbohydrates or protein. They act as a carrier for fat soluble vitamins. They offer a sense of satiety. And in cooking, they um, also enhance the flavors of food and give our mouths that wonderful feel that's very, very rich and satisfying. Fats are used for insulation and cushioning. They play a role in growth and repair. Um, they also have a role in hormone production and even help us maintain our body temperature. So similar to protein, fatty acids are either essential or non-essential. And while all fatty acids factor into good fetal development, two, linoleic and alpha-linoleic acid, are central in neural and visual fetal development. As these are found in a variety of oils and animal fats, which are listed in your text, generally recommending a variety of foods is key to ensuring proper intake of all nutrients. Again, just going back to that balance, variety, and moderation theme. So although supplementation during pregnancy is important, so fats are either unsaturated or saturated. And within each group are several more types of fats. So unsaturated fats are generally liquid at room temperature, while saturated fatty acids are solid. So again, unsaturated fatty acids, those would be more of your oils. Again, there are exceptions. And saturated fatty acids are solid, like butter at room temperature. Now, unsaturated fats can either be polyunsaturated or monounsaturated. So unsaturated fats can either have many unsaturated links or one unsaturated link. Saturated fats can exist as transaturated fatty acids. And these came about um, a while ago. So in order to lengthen the time of food would remain unspoiled, fats were solidified. These oils don't quite spoil as quickly as butter, and they would extend the shelf life of foods. And so back decades ago, when these were first formulated, this was a good thing. Extending the shelf life of products was considered to be you know, a, a, a smart food advance. These are the fats that you really do want to be on the alert for. Although, um, by the end of this year, they should no longer be in existence, at least in our country. You won't find them um, past 2018. The FDA actually no longer recognizes trans fat as an item on the grass list or generally recognized as safe list. Trans fats raise the LDL or the bad cholesterol and make people more likely to get heart disease. Uh, they also lower the good cholesterol, or the HDLs. Um, and by now, again, with the exception of the natural trans fat that's found in beef, lamb, or full dairy products found naturally, all trans fats will be phased out. You do still um, need to look for nutrition, um, to look on nutrition labels of packaged food items, um, you know, in the next few months or so, depending on when you're listening to this lecture. Um, and 
those will appear on the ingredients list as hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. So the result is that um, changing to products that don't use hydrogenated oils will basically shorten the shelf life of baked goods in, in our pantries, but our bodies will benefit. So polyunsaturated fats, found mostly in vegetable oils, help lower both blood cholesterol levels and triglyceride levels, especially when you substitute them for saturated fats. One type of polyunsaturated fat are the omega-3 fatty acids, whose potential heart health benefits have justifiably received a lot of attention. Uh, so the omega-3s are found in fatty fish like salmon, trout, catfish, mackerel, and others. And the types found in fish called, and again, you're not going to need to know this because they're more commonly known by their abbreviations, but so docosahexaenoic acid, which we will be calling DHA, and eicosapentaenoic acid, or EPA, are um, the two primarily found in fish. And these seem to have some of the strongest health benefits and very powerful roles um, during pregnancy and lactation. Another um, form known as alpha-linoleic acid um, is found in vegetable oils as well as flaxseed, walnuts or walnut oil, and dark leafy vegetables uh, like spinach. Now the different types of omega-3 fatty acids can be confusing. So again, there are the two fish oils, um, the DHA and EPA, and then there are the plant sources, um, the ALA, and the ALA from the plant source is converted into omega-3 fatty acids in the body. Okay, so just for the purposes of this course, keep in mind that studies have generally used fish oils as the source for um, omega-3 fatty acids, the predominant source. Um, so while plant sources with ALA may have some of the same benefits, um, they really haven't been researched as well and there is less known about them. So for now, um, fish oils with DHA and EPA um, they just have the more established benefit. So as a quick side note, um, flax seeds, which are gaining in a little bit of popularity, so I'm just going to throw this little tidbit in here. Um, they, these need to be ground, really, in order for the body to access the omega-3 fatty acids. If they're not ground up, they really just do pass through the body um, untouched and really won't be beneficial. So you do need to grind the flax seeds up. And again, those can be added to breakfast cereal, um, sprinkled in yogurt, added to baked goods, um, even including breads and muffins. Um, so a teaspoon of ground flaxseed um, can also be added to low-fat mayo um, or mustard when making a sandwich. And the reason why I'm you know, going into detail about this is it really is a very smart and efficient way to get some of these omega-3s um, in your diet as they are becoming uh, more and more prominently thought to be um, just highly advantageous to all of us, you know, as research is going on and on. So just keep in mind that this is, um, you know, a nutrient that you do want to pay attention to um, on a personal level as well as um, for your clients as well. So again, even um, you can find enriched milk and eggs, um, breads, um, and breakfast bars, for example, that do contain these nutrients. Do check the product labels to make sure. So fish does, again, just to sum up, does contain the most effective um, type of omega-3s. Um, so the American Heart Association recommends eating two servings of fatty fish each week. But as a cautionary note, and I mentioned this earlier in this um, presentation, that pregnant women and young children really should stay away from um, shark, swordfish, king mackerel, and there are a few others like tilefish, orange roughy, um, because um, these bigger species fish do tend to present more of a risk um, because they are just higher in mercury. And so plant sources of unsaturated fat are a good substitute for saturated or trans fat. Um, again, they just won't have quite the same full effect on cardiovascular disease as the fatty fish will. And again, you know, cooking style, it does matter. Frying up your trout, um, while you will still be getting the trout, isn't 
um, the heart healthiest method of cooking. So keeping in mind that um, if you're going to um, choose to eat healthy by choosing more fish in your diet, you don't want to destroy that benefit by um you know, frying or, you know, deep frying um, when you have other healthier alternatives that are just as tasty. So steaming, broiling, barbecuing, stir frying, sauteing, grilling, poaching, baking, um, you know, with a little bit of added fat, these really are more of the go-to methods for healthy cooking techniques. And so just a quick word about supplements. When you're at a grocery store, pharmacy, Trader Joe's, you will see that the market is just flooded with omega-3 supplements. And it is advantageous to get your omega-3s from food, but an omega-3 supplement is one of the um, better supplements uh, if you are going to make a decision to go down that route. So let fish or even fortified food products be your dominant source of omega 3s but you know supplements in this case may serve some some advantage you can even again when i was mentioning earlier about reading the labels for example some chickens they are given feed that is high in omega 3s so their eggs will contain more omega 3s than chickens who aren't given that specific diet so again check the product label on that and for people with established heart disease, there really isn't uh, any research indicating that omega-3s will decrease the risk of heart disease. Um, but there is research seeming to indicate that omega-3s may help with mental sharpness and even arthritis later on in life. So there is a lot of research that is currently um, being done in this area. And all I can say is more to come. Who knows what the next set of dietary guidelines um, will have in them um, as research just continues to move forward. So along with the omega-3 fatty acids, we also have something called omega-6 fatty acids. And I realize that we've been sitting on this slide for quite a while, but the omega-6 fatty acids, while also needed for a healthy diet, are actually needed in the right balance in order to protect the heart, the joints, and the skin, and the more. So the American diet is um, very excessive in omega-6s. So these fatty acids are found in corn oil and vegetable oils. And like I mentioned, they are just used profusely um, in the States. So too much omega-6, it can raise blood pressure. It can lead to blood clots that can cause heart attack and stroke and can also cause your body to retain water. So the trick is to really try and include more omega-3 fatty acids and less omega-6 fatty acids. So moving on, we had just finished talking about polyunsaturated fats. So the other unsaturated fats are the monounsaturated fats. Um, these are more of the fatty acid dream team, and these also reduce the risk of heart disease. And these are Mediterranean diet staples. So Mediterranean countries consume a great deal of these. Usually it's olive oil, uh, and this is often credited with the low levels of heart disease in these countries. And so monounsaturated fats are typically liquid at room temperature, but they do solidify if refrigerated. So you can just pop your peanut oil into the refrigerator and see what happens. Um, you'll see that it does um, become solid uh, when it's in the refrigerator. These are more of the heart healthy fats. Uh, these are rich in vitamin E, um, an antioxidant that's often lacking in American diets. And this helps us by reducing the oxygen related damage to the vascular system. So these monounsaturated fats can be found in olives, avocados, um, hazelnuts, almonds, Brazil nuts, and cashews. Now to make it more simple, there really aren't any nuts that should be avoided because when consumed in proper amounts, nuts are a really good source of, of the good fats. It's just keeping in mind that generally the portion sizes for nuts are small. In addition, nuts are also a good source of protein. They're also a good source of fiber. They're also a good source of a variety of vitamins and minerals. It's just keep portion control in mind. One portion of nuts is equal to about one ounce, which is pretty small. It's usually about a third of a cup, and it provides approximately 160 to 180 calories. But nuts are 
really the, a classic food when we look at nutrient density. So even though they do have a lot of calories, you get a lot of bang for your buck with nuts because they really are nutrient dense. And there are also the seeds like sesame seeds, pumpkin seeds that are also a good source of your monounsaturated fats. So in the oils, uh, monounsaturated fats are found in olive oil, canola oil, sunflower oil, and peanut oil. And again, the USDA dietary guidelines have a very specific dietary plan called the Mediterranean diet plan. And so if you're looking to increase your intake of monounsaturated fats, you might want to hop on um, their website and look up the Mediterranean diet plan. That's where the goodness of fat ends. We've talked about the benefits of the polyunsaturated fats and the monounsaturated fats, but there is another side to the fat story, and it's the one that um, we're probably a little more familiar with. So there are two types of fat that should be eaten sparingly. These are the saturated and the transaturated fatty acids. Both raise cholesterol levels, both clog arteries, both increase the risk for heart disease. And there is evidence that saturated fats have an effect on increasing colon and prostate cancer risk. So saturated fats are found in animal products, meat, poultry skin, high fat dairy, and in eggs, as well as in the vegetable fats um, like coconut and palm oils. Um, and there are some other sources as well. And the current dietary guidelines recommend limiting saturated fats to 10% or less of your total calories. And that recommendation has not changed since the previous guidelines. However, just a side note, the American Heart Association recommends actually keeping them to just 5 to 6% of total calories, which actually dropped from its previous upper limit of 7% just 10 years ago. So it looks like the American Heart Association is taking um, those saturated fats a little more seriously. The animal or partially hydrogenated fats should be replaced with, with liquid vegetable oils. Again, um, we're substituting and making small shifts. So instead of using those fats, you want to think of the monounsaturated fats that we just talked about, like olive, sunflower, or canola in place of butter, margarine, or lard. Um, and you know what? <laughs> I'll, I'll bring up avocado toast. I, I'll go there. Um, even avocado toast, there is something to that latest food craze because switching out butter for avocado, um, switching out the saturated for the healthy monounsaturated avocado just makes sense and it is pretty delicious. So with that said, studies observed that while switching saturated fats for unsaturated fats is associated with reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, replacing saturated fat with carbohydrates does not reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And again, like we covered earlier, there are two types of trans fat, the naturally occurring type found in small amounts in dairy and meat, and the artificial kind that occur um, when liquid oils are hardened into partially hydrogenated fats. So natural trans fats are not what we're worrying about here. You don't have to be concerned about those, especially um, if you're choosing the lower fat or non-fat dairy products and the lean meats. The real worry in the American diet is the artificial trans fat. And like I mentioned earlier, those are being phased out, um, but we still do need to just, you know, keep an eye out. These are used extensively in frying, in baked goods, in cookies, icings, crackers, packaged snack foods, microwave popcorn, popcorn, excuse me, and some margarines as well. One thing to keep in mind is that these man-made fats are taken up by the body much more efficiently than the omega-3s. So trans fatty acids not only harm your health, they also block the absorption of healthy fats. Just to look at fat in a nutshell, um, most foods contain a combination of fats, um, but they are classified according to their dominant fat. So for example, nearly half of the fat in peanut butter is the beneficial monounsaturated fat. And resist the urge to pour off the heart healthy oil that's separated out of the natural peanut butter. You want to go ahead and mix it in. So this chart lists sources of the good for you unsaturated fats 
as well as some examples of fats that you want to avoid. And this isn't a comprehensive chart by any means. You can see the foods listed in red are the saturated fats or the trans fatty acids, and these are the ones that you want to consume less of. And the polyunsaturated fats, as well as the monounsaturated fats, well, these are the fats that you want to use more of. These are the ones um, that are heart healthy and beneficial for us. So to sum up, unsaturated fatty acids are found in two forms. Monounsaturated fatty acids come from vegetables, nuts, and seeds. And polyunsaturated fatty acids are found in nuts, seeds, and fish. And again, these fats do not elevate cholesterol levels, are generally recognized as the healthier fats. Uh, but that being said, just keep in mind, we can't ignore that dietary fat does play a significant role in obesity. So fat is a very um, calorie dense nutrient. It has more than double the calories per gram than carbs and protein. Fat has nine calories per gram, while carbs and protein have only four grams or four calories per gram. Alcohol has seven calories per gram. Any fat, whether it is a beneficial fat or a harmful fat, has nine calories per gram. They are all the same. So they are still all going to be the same in terms of how calorically dense they are. So cutting the total fat in diet not only helps shed pounds, but it can also help us live longer and healthier lives. So being overweight contributes to the risk of many types of cancer, including colon cancer and breast cancer among postmenopausal women. While eating less total fat will not directly lower your cancer risk, it will help you control your weight, which in turn can reduce your risk of cancer and other disorders. Um, so it's easy to overeat fats, especially um, in the U.S. They lurk in so many foods that, um, that Americans love, such as French fries, processed foods, cakes, cookies, um, chocolate, ice cream, you know, thick, juicy steaks, you know, luscious cheeses, and even in those avocados, olives, and nuts. So again, here's a test your knowledge slide. I'll read the slide and then give you a few seconds to answer the question. So what are the healthier forms of fat? So used in moderation, the healthier forms of fat include oils, such as olive, sesame, peanut, canola, sunflower, soy, and vegetable, as well as olives, avocados, nuts, seeds, fish. So let's look at our micronutrients now. Vitamins are organic substances the body needs to help regulate and coordinate functions of the body. So when you hear the word organic, um, it just means something different than what the general public currently relates it to. In biochemistry, it just indicates that the compound um, contains the element carbon. Non-organic means that the element carbon is not present. There are two forms of vitamins, um, water-soluble and fat-soluble. Now, water-soluble vitamins include the B vitamins, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, etc., as well as vitamin C. Water-soluble vitamins are not able to be stored in the body and therefore need to be replenished. If they are in excess, they are excreted. Now, fat-soluble vitamins, those are vitamins A, D, E, and K, are stored in the body, and they're stored in the body's fatty tissues. As they are accumulated for longer periods of time, toxicity can be a risk if they are consumed in excess. Now back to the water-soluble vitamins. Due to their water-soluble nature, during lactation, these vitamins shift from maternal blood into breast milk, so intake of these nutrients matters. While all of these nutrients matter for a healthy pregnancy outcome, as well as for successful lactation, there are key water-soluble nutrients to consider. First, folate. So folate is a water-soluble B vitamin that is naturally present in some foods, added to others, and is also available as a dietary supplement. Folate, formerly known as folicin or even vitamin B9, is the generic term for both naturally occurring food folate and folic acid. So folic acid is the form of the vitamin that is used in dietary supplements and fortified foods. Folate's most well-known role 
is in preventing neural tube defects. Now, neural tube defects result in malformations of the spine, such as spina bifida, uh, malformations of the skull and of the brain, uh, also known as anencephaly. Sorry, they are the most common major congenital malformations of the central nervous system and result from a failure of the neural tube to close at either the upper or lower end during days 21 to 28 after conception. Women with insufficient folate intakes are at increased risk of giving birth to infants with neural tube defects, although the mechanism responsible for this effect still isn't quite known. 30 years ago, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, began requiring manufacturers to add folic acid to enriched bread, cereals, flours, cornmeals, pastas, rice, and other grain products because the link between inadequate folate intake and neural tube defects was so apparent. Because cereals and grains are widely consumed in the United States, these products have become very important contributors of folic acid to the American diet. The fortification program was projected to increase folic acid intakes by approximately 100 micrograms a day, but the program actually increased mean folic acid intakes in the United States by almost double that. Other countries, including Canada, Costa Rica, Chile, and South Africa, have also established mandatory folic acid fortification programs. Since 1998, when the mandatory folic acid fortification program took effect in the U.S., neural tube defects rates have declined drastically by 25 to 30 percent. However, there are significant and racial ethnic disparities. Spina bifida and encephaly rates have declined significantly among Hispanic and non-Hispanic white births in the U.S., but not among black births. Differences in dietary habits and supplemental taking practices could be a factor in these disparities. Additionally, factors other than folate status, such as maternal diabetes, obesity, and intake of other nutrients, such as vitamin B12, are believed to affect the risk of neural tube defects. Inadequate maternal folate status has also been associated with low infant birth weight, preterm delivery, and fetal growth retardation. Whereas folic acid supplementation has been shown to lengthen mean gestational age and lower the age of preterm birth. Research also suggests that folic acid, in combination with a multivitamin supplement, helps minimize the risk of congenital heart defects. The major natural sources of dietary folate are legumes, green leafy vegetables, liver, citrus fruits and juices, and whole wheat bread. It is also available in nuts, beans, peas, dairy products, poultry and meat, eggs, seafood, and grains. Spinach, liver, yeast, asparagus, and Brussels sprouts are among the foods with the highest levels of folate. Compared to naturally occurring folate in foods, the synthetic form of the vitamin, folic acid, contained in fortified foods and supplements, is almost twice as well absorbed. So to prevent neural tube defects, all women of childbearing years should consume 400 micrograms per day of folate from fortified foods, like cereals and other grains, or from supplements, or from both. Moreover, beginning one month before conception, pre-pregnant women should up their intake and consume folate from foods in a varied diet that reach up to 500 micrograms a day. Now, this is the ideal situation. But keep in mind that 50% of all American pregnancies are unplanned. You can see the increased levels recommended for pregnant and lactating women in the chart on the slide. In many cases, female is the general non-pregnant, non-lactating population. Pregnant is pregnant and lactating is lactating. So you can see that a woman um, who is not pregnant has a recommended intake of 400 micrograms a day. During pregnancy or right before, it goes up to 500 micrograms a day, and during lactation, it goes up even higher to 600 micrograms a day. Many lactating women should also be viewed as pre-pregnant women. Also, the critical time when the neural tube defect is happening is frequently prior to, or just barely when, a woman discovers her prenatal status. By then, supplementation is tragically ineffective in offering protection against spina bifida or anencephaly. During pregnancy, demands for folate increase due to its role in nucleic acid synthesis. To accommodate this need, 
the FNB recently increased the folate RDA from 400 microgram a day for non-pregnant women to 500 milligrams a day during pregnancy. The level of intake might be difficult to achieve through diet alone. And that's why the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends a prenatal vitamin supplement for most pregnant women to ensure that they obtain adequate amounts of folic acid as well as other nutrients. Now let's look at vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 or cobalamin is a water-soluble vitamin that is naturally present in some foods, added to others, and is available as a dietary supplement and a prescription medication. Vitamin B12 exists in several forms and contains the mineral cobalt. So compounds with vitamin B12 activity are collectively called cobalamins. Vitamin B12 plays a role in making DNA. It also helps keep nerve cells and red blood cells healthy. Naturally found in animal products, vitamin B12 is particularly high in shellfish, organ meats such as liver, some game meats like venison, and fish such as herring, trout, and sardines. In the United States, primary sources of vitamin B12 are mixed dishes containing meat, fish, or poultry, milk beverages, and ready-to-eat fortified cereals. Strict vegetarians and vegans are at greater risk than lacto-ovo vegetarians and non-vegetarians of developing vitamin B12 deficiency because natural food sources of vitamin B12 are primarily limited to animal foods. Fortified breakfast cereals are one of the few sources of vitamin B12 from plants and can be used as a dietary source of vitamin B12 for strict vegetarians and vegans. Since vitamin B12 crosses the placenta during pregnancy and is present in breast milk, exclusively breastfed infants of women who consume no animal products may have very limited resources of vitamin B12. They can develop vitamin B12 deficiency within months of birth. Undetected and untreated vitamin B12 deficiency in infants can result in severe and permanent neurological damage. The American Dietetic Association recommends supplemental vitamin B12 for vegans and lacto-ovo vegetarians during both pregnancy and lactation to ensure that enough vitamin B12 is transferred prenatally and via human milk to the baby. Pregnant and lactating women who follow strict vegetarian or vegan diets should consult with a pediatrician regarding vitamin B12 supplements for their infants and children. The RDI for vitamin B12 for all women past the age of 14 is 2.4 micrograms per deciliter. During pregnancy, it's 2.6 micrograms per day, and during lactation, it's 2.8 micrograms a day. So vitamin A comes in two forms, and this will be the first fat-soluble vitamin that we'll be discussing. One form of vitamin A is from animals, and those are the retinols. Those are its active form. This type, which is preformed vitamin A, is found in meat, poultry, fish, eggs, and dairy products. The other form is primarily from plants, the most important of which is beta-carotene. I'm sure you've all heard of that nutrient. So the second type, provitamin A, is found in fruits, veggies, and other plant-based products. For example, red peppers are an excellent source. A half cup gives you almost half of what you need for a single day. Deficiencies around the planet in developing countries are well documented, and vitamin A is critical to normal growth and development. Inadequate storage can lead to blindness, anemia, immunofficiency, while excesses can lead to cognitive disorders. However, in developed countries, vitamin A deficiency is much less common than in underdeveloped countries. So vitamin D is our second fat-soluble vitamin that we'll be talking about. It's naturally present in very few foods, added to others, and is available as a dietary supplement. It is also produced endogenously when ultraviolet rays from sunlight strike the skin and trigger vitamin D synthesis. Now vitamin D is essential for strong bones because it helps the body use calcium from the diet. Traditionally, vitamin D deficiency has been associated with rickets, a disease in which the bone tissue doesn't properly mineralize, leading to soft bones and skeletal deformities. Increasingly, research is revealing the importance of vitamin D in protecting against a host of additional health problems, such as increased risk of death from cardiovascular disease, cognitive impairment in older adults, severe asthma in children, and cancer. 
Research suggests that vitamin D could play a role in the prevention and treatment of a number of different conditions, including type 1 and type 2 diabetes, hypertension, glucose intolerance, and multiple sclerosis. So unless you count the sun, vitamin D is pretty limited in nature. Fortified food provides most of the vitamin D in the American diet. For example, almost all of the U.S. milk supply is voluntarily fortified. Vitamin D is found in fatty fish, such as salmon, tuna, and mackerel, which are among the best sources. It's also found in beef liver, cheese, and egg yolks in smaller amounts. Mushrooms actually do provide some vitamin uh, D, and in some mushrooms that are newly available in stores, the vitamin D content is actually being boosted by exposing these mushrooms to UV light. Almost all of the U.S. milk supply is fortified with 400 international units of vitamin D per quart. However, foods made from milk, like cheese and ice cream, are usually not fortified. Vitamin D is added to many breakfast cereals and to certain brands of orange juice, yogurt, margarine, and soy beverages. But again, always check the label. It should be noted that the vitamin D RDAs are set on the basis of minimal sun exposure and are 600 international units across the board. Pregnant women at increased risk of vitamin D deficiency include those with little exposure to sunlight, vegan diets, and those with darker skin. Some consider a vitamin D deficiency to be a sunlight deficiency. And in the case of vitamin D, low levels of vitamin D during pregnancy can result in the baby experiencing a deficiency as the, baby body, as the baby's body accumulates vitamin D prenatally. Now, do infants get enough vitamin D from breast milk? No. Breast milk alone does not provide infants with an adequate amount of vitamin D, even if mothers are taking vitamins containing vitamin D. Shortly after birth, most infants will need an additional source of vitamin D. The American Academy of Pediatrics, or the AAP, recommends that exclusively and partially breastfed infants be supplemented with 400 international units of vitamin D per day, the RDA for this nutrient during infancy, because vitamin D requirements cannot ordinarily be met by human milk alone. Breast milk provides around... Um, less than 25 international units a liter to around 78 international units per liter. Again, very, very individualized. The vitamin D content of human milk is related to the mother's vitamin D status. So mothers who supplement with high doses of vitamin D may have correspondingly high levels of this nutrient in their milk. Research is showing vitamin D involvement in more and more areas of concern. And research is really um, becoming more and more prevalent with this nutrient. Vitamin E. So vitamin E is a fat-soluble nutrient found in many foods. In the body, it acts as an antioxidant, helping to protect vitamins A and C, helping to protect red blood cells, and helping to, prevent, to protect essential fatty acids from being destroyed by free radicals. Free radicals are compounds formed when our bodies convert the food we eat into energy. People are also exposed to free radicals in the environment from cigarette smoke, air pollution, and ultraviolet light from the sun, among others. The body also needs vitamin E to boost its immune system so that it can fight off invading bacteria and viruses. It helps to widen blood vessels and keep blood from clotting within them. And in addition, cells use vitamin E to interact with each other and to carry out many important functions. Some individuals, most individuals, probably get enough vitamin E. But not getting the minimum amount can be serious. The body needs fat to absorb vitamin E, so people with certain digestive problems may not get what they need. A deficiency can damage nerves, eyes, and the immune system. The best source of vitamin E is wheat germ oil, although other um, sources include um, vegetable oils like wheat germ, sunflower, and safflower oils. Um, these are among the best sources of vitamin E. Corn and soybean oils, as well as margarine and salad dressing, also provide some vitamin E. Um, nuts are another source. Nuts such as peanuts, hazelnuts, and especially almonds, and seeds, uh, like sunflower seeds, are also among um, some pretty solid sources of vitamin E. Green vegetables, such as spinach and broccoli, provide some vitamin E as well. Now, food companies add vitamin E to some breakfast cereals. They are also added um, into um, fruit juices, margarines, and spreads, and other foods as well. 
And again, to find out which ones have vitamin E, you're going to want to check those product labels. Now, vitamin E is great for skin, hair, and nails. Uh, so it's been studied as a way to prevent scars and stretch marks. And it makes sense that it would help with this, but there's not enough peer-based evidence to prove it. And some doctors actually warn against it because in some folks, it can actually trigger an allergic reaction. So infants born very prematurely or with a very low birth weight may actually have a deficiency um, in this vitamin. Vitamin K is known for its role in blood clotting, and it also influences bone health. There are two forms, one available primarily from leafy greens and one that is synthesized in our GI systems, our gastrointestinal systems from bacteria. Vitamin K is found in green leafy veggies, such as spinach, kale, broccoli, and lettuce. It's also found in vegetable oils. Uh, it can be found in certain fruits, such as blueberries and figs, and also meat, cheese, eggs, and soybeans. Infants in the United States, born in the United States, are routinely given a vitamin K injection due to low infant stores at birth per the recommendation of um, the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics. And only small amounts of vitamin K are transferred across the placenta during pregnancy. In addition, human breast milk only contains small amounts. The primary gut flora, lactobacillus, found in breastfed babies doesn't synthesize vitamin K. And without sufficient vitamin K, blood just simply doesn't clot and infants can experience hemorrhagic disease, um, which although rare, is life-threatening. So the DRI for vitamin K um, is, as you can see, uh, for women ages 14 through 18, a 75 micrograms per day, uh, which remains consistent whether or not you are non-pregnant, pregnant, or lactating. If you are in the 19 to 50 age range, excuse me, age range, the uh, amount per day is 90 micrograms, again, regardless of whether you're pregnant or lactating. So another test your knowledge quiz. What nutrient might women who practice strict vegetarianism be low in, and why? So strict vegetarians and vegans are at greater risk than lacto-ova vegetarians as well as non-vegetarians of developing vitamin B12 deficiency because natural food sources of vitamin B12 are limited primarily to animal foods. Do breastfed infants need a vitamin D supplement? So yes, they do. The AAP recommends that exclusively and partially breastfed infants be supplemented with 400 international units of vitamin D per day. The RDA for this nutrient during infancy, because vitamin D requirements cannot ordinarily be met by human milk alone. So minerals are inorganic substances essential for the body. Now, can anyone remember what organic meant? Organic meant with a carbon molecule. So inorganic means without carbon. So these minerals help form bones, teeth, and blood cells. They help regulate the body's fluids and aid in the chemical reactions of cells. Now the body does not manufacture them and therefore they need to be obtained through food or supplementation. So first we'll look at calcium, which is the most abundant mineral in the body, and it has an abundance of roles to play as well. So almost all calcium is stored in bones and teeth where it supports their structure and hardness. The body also needs calcium for muscles to move and for nerves to carry messages between the brain and every body part. In addition, calcium is used to help blood vessels move blood throughout the body and to help release hormones and enzymes that affect almost every function in the human body. Less than 1% of total body calcium is needed to support these mentioned critical metabolic functions. The rest? Well, the remaining 99% is supporting the, the skeleton. Serum calcium is very tightly regulated, and it really does not fluctuate with changes in dietary intakes. The body uses bone tissue as a reservoir for and source of calcium to maintain constant concentrations of calcium in blood, muscle, and intracellular fluids. So can anyone tell me where calcium is found? So calcium is found in milk, 
yogurt and cheese. And these are the main food sources of calcium for the majority of people in the United States. Uh, they're also found in veggies such as kale, broccoli, and Chinese cabbage. And these are fairly adequate vegetable sources of calcium. So although spinach may have calcium, that, that particular calcium is poorly absorbed. Also fish with soft edible bones um, that can be eaten such as canned sardines, canned salmon. These are also decent animal sources of calcium. And then again, a lot of grains such as bread, pastas, and unfortified cereals, uh, while not rich in calcium, they do add significant amounts of calcium to the diet simply because we eat them often or in large amounts. Calcium is added to some breakfast cereals, fruit juices, soy, and rice beverages, as well as tofu. To find out whether these foods have calcium, again, I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but you do need to check the product labels. During pregnancy, calcium is needed for the healthy development of a baby's teeth, bones, heart, nerves, and muscles. When a pregnant woman does not consume enough calcium, it is taken from her. It is taken from her bones for the baby. And it is important to consume adequate amounts of calcium daily before, during, and after pregnancy. Women under the age of 25 have additional requirements because they themselves are increasing their own bone content. So the DRI for calcium is fairly consistent, whether again, you're non-pregnant, non-lactating, pregnant or lactating, from the age of 14 through 18, you need around 1300 milligrams a day. And again, this is just because uh, women at this age are still uh, laying down calcium uh, in their skeleton and from the ages of 19 to 50, because that process is, is really slowed down, it's only 1,000 milligrams a day. So a few other notes about calcium. A lactose intolerance and a milk allergy are not the same thing. A lactose intolerance has to do with the body not having enough of the milk enzyme lactase to break down milk sugar lactose. You remember uh, we talked about the OSE symbolizing um, or signaling that OSC means that there's a sugar involved. Not having enough of the enzyme lactase leads to bloating, diarrhea, and other gastrointestinal discomfort. So for women with lactose intolerance, dairy pro products with less lactose, such as cheese, yogurt, or milk with um, added lactase enzyme, can be substituted for regular milk. And it's estimated that almost 25% of U.S. population um, suffers from some degree of lactose intolerance. And again, as this intolerance is varied, some individuals can still tolerate small amounts, again, individualized, of lactose. Other popular milks, such as almond milk, um, cashew milk, there's a lot of different milks out there these days, well, these milks may or may not have sufficient calcium depending on their fortification. Again, read the labels. A milk allergy has to do with another macronutrient entirely, the milk protein. Remember, lactose intolerance concern, concerns the milk sugar. So women with a milk allergy would not be able to consume most products intended for lactose intolerance, as many of them still contain the milk protein that draws the allergic response. So there is increased internal intestinal absorption during pregnancy, and ingesting vitamin D with calcium assists with maximum absorption and use. And also, uh, please note that calcium is mobilized from the maternal skeleton during breastfeeding, although there is significant recovery afterwards. Breastfeeding actually imparts a protective effect against osteoporosis. And for pregnant women who do not consume milk products, such as, um, again, due to a milk allergy or other reason, or they also don't consume calcium fortified foods or beverages, such as those containing soy or some of the nut milks, a calcium as well as a vitamin D supplement may be especially needed. Uh, there is a table in your text that lists all sources of um, calcium. So calcium carbonate, such as found in calcium soft chews or Caltrate or Oscal, Tums, Vivactive, um, and other supplements as well, uh, that one is most readily absorbed by, by most people and is also the least costly form of the calcium supplement. Calcium citrate products such as Citracal may also be recommended, but they may be more expensive and they may require patients um, to take more tablets to uh, uh, achieve the optimal dosage. Again, to improve absorption, calcium supplements can be divided into one 
or two or three doses and taken with meals. Vitamin D facilitates absorption of calcium, so uh, whenever possa possible, uh, recommend a calcium supplement that contains uh, 400 to 800 international unit units of the vitamin D. The DRIs for iron reflect a non-prenatal woman's need for additional iron due to the demands of menstruation as well as pregnancy and lactation. The male requirements for iron is included to demonstrate the difference um, just in this one nutrient. Um, so even as men have, generally speaking, increased muscle mass, their requirements are still lower. The IOM, the Institute of Medicine, notes that because the median intake of dietary iron by pregnant women is well below the EAR, pregnant women need iron supplementation. And the, di the Dietary Guidelines for Americans advises that women who are pregnant take an iron supplement when recommended by an obstetrician or other health care provider. It adds that low intakes of iron are a public health concern for pregnant women. The ACOG recommend testing to determine whether supplementation is necessary. And the bottom line is that women really should discuss this with their OBs. Healthy, non-anemic prenatal women surrender their iron via the placenta. They also store adequate iron stores to provide for her baby via human milk with sufficient iron for the first several months, again, if they are healthy and not anemic. During lactation, human milk iron levels remain constant because they are pulled from maternal iron stores and are independent of dietary intake. Full-term healthy babies receive enough iron from their mothers in the first third of pregnancy to last for around the first four months of life. Although the iron delivered through breast milk is in small amounts, it is satisfactory and highly bioavailable. The iron stores of infants are not depleted until they are around four to six months of age or even later. Even still, current recommendations from the AAP standard supplementation of iron may have a negative effect on breastfed infants as lactoferrin, uh, an important immune compound, which we'll talk about later, loses its ability to inhibit the growth of harmful bacteria when it's saturated with exogenous iron, uh, such as from supplementation. So iron status improves when infants, in combination with human milk, begin eating iron-rich foods. For infants who are exclusively breastfed, they consider them to be at increased risk for iron deficiency after four months of age. And the AAP recommends giving breastfed infants one milligram per kilogram per day of a liquid iron supplement until iron-containing solid foods are introduced at about six months of age. When solid foods are added to the baby's diet, they recommend to continue breastfeeding until at least 12 months. For babies who are partially breastfed, well, the iron recommendation remains the same as that for fully breastfed babies if more than half of the daily feedings are from human milk and the child is not receiving iron-containing complementary foods. For formula-fed infants, well, it is recommended that an iron-fortified formula containing from 4 to 12 milligrams of iron be used from birth through the entire first year of life. Premature babies have fewer iron stores, and so they often need additional iron beyond what they receive from breast milk or formula. And like all medications, iron tablets should be kept out of children's reach, because even if iron is only a natural mineral, an accidental overdose can still be life-threatening for children. The RDA for vegetarians are 1.8 times higher than for people who eat meat. Uh, this is because, like we mentioned earlier, the heme iron from meat is more bioavailable than non-heme iron from plant-based foods. And meat, poultry, and seafood increase the absorption of non-heme iron. Iron deficiency anemia is most common in populations with low socioeconomic status, multiple gestations, and limited education. For example, the incidence of iron deficient toddlers in the U.S. are... Uh, for the Caucasian population, it's 6%. For the black population, it's 6%. But for the Hispanic population, it's double that at 12%. And 6% of white and black toddlers aged 1 to 3 years in the U.S. are iron deficient as compared with 12% of Hispanic toddlers. Now for prenatal women, the incidence of iron deficiency um, again, there's a large disparity. So for the Caucasian population, 13% um, have iron deficiency anemia. 
Uh, the black population, that's up at almost 30% at 29.6. And for the Hispanic population, it's 23.6. So again, you can see that, again, there is a big range of, of incidents. Iron deficiency, including iron deficiency anemia, is more common among children and adolescents in food insecure households than in food secure households. Remember that iron in human milk is absorbed efficiently due to the effects of vitamin C as well as lactose. One additional note about iron supplementation. So when recommended, tolerance may be difficult for some women due to heartburn, nausea, constipation, uh, and even diarrhea. To ease discomfort, it can be suggested that uh, women take these tablets at night so they can kind of sleep through their discomfort. Um, keep in mind that iron tablets, um, they should not be taken with milk or coffee as absorption can be decreased. Um, and additional suggestions about adequate or additional fiber um, may be needed as well um, in terms of if they are finding that they're having some difficulty with constipation due to the iron tablets. Um, so sufficient iron intake during the breastfeeding period is necessary to rebuild iron stores. The iron in human milk is absorbed more efficiently than the iron in cow's milk, again primarily due to the presence of vitamin C. Lactose, which also assists in iron absorption, is high in human milk, especially compared to certain infant formulas that contain zero lactose. So maternal intake of iron does not influ influence breast milk concentration. So now on to zinc. Nutritionally speaking, well, zinc is a pretty busy mineral. He's a pretty busy guy. He is involved in numerous aspects of cellular metabolism. Um, zinc is required for the catalytic activity of approximately 100 enzymes, and it also plays a role in immune function, protein synthesis, wound healing, DNA synthesis, and cell division. Zinc also supports normal growth and development during pregnancy, childhood, and adolescence, and is required for proper sense of taste and smell. A daily intake of zinc is required to maintain a steady state because the body has no specialized zinc storage system. Pregnant women, particularly those starting their pregnancy with marginal zinc status, are at increased risk of becoming zinc insufficient due, in high part, to high fetal requirements for zinc. Lactation can also deplete maternal zinc stores, and for these reasons, the RDA for zinc is higher for pregnant lactating women than for um, non-pregnant or non-lactating women. So the RDA for zinc during pregnancy is 12 milligrams per day for ages 14 to 18 years and 11 milligrams per day for ages 19 to 50. And um, food sources of zinc include meat, some shellfish, oysters, fortified cereals, legumes, nuts, and whole grains. However, bioavailability can be low in vegetarian diets due to the presence of phytate, fiber, and or calcium that may inhibit zinc absorption. High intakes of supplemental iron may also inhibit zinc absorption when both are taken without food. So the next slide is a test your knowledge slide. What is the most common nutritional deficiency in pregnancy? Iron deficiency anemia. And so we are moving on to our last nutrient, um, and this is water. Um, about 50 to 55 percent of a female body weight consists of water. And water is literally required for every single body function. It flushes toxins out of organs, carries nutrients to cells, it cushions joints, it also helps digest the food you eat. The most abundant, as well as the most critical, nutrient of the body, most foods contain water which is absorbed during digestion. Adequate hydration is essential to a healthy pregnancy as a woman accumulates um, six to nine liters of water during, digest during gestation. Also, pregnancy concerns can include constipation, which can be exacerbated by inadequate liquids. Now, total water intake for pregnancy, including drinking water, beverages, and food, is recommended to be about three liters a day. This includes approximately 2.3 liters or about 10 cups as total beverages. So again, this isn't just water. This is also tea, milk, juice, etc. Um, 
thirst can help determine water consumption. And something else to be mindful of is looking at your urine. So your urine should be a clear to a, y- a light yellow color with the exception of the initial morning output. So again, you're adequately hydrated if um, your urine is um, very clear to a pale yellow. If urine is dark or very strong smelling, um, that would be a signal that you need additional water or fluid consumption. And that goes the same for an infant, um, an older infant. So generally the additional water um, is obtained with additional prenatal and lactation um, food intake. Uh, inadequate intake during lactation will result in less urine output rather than less milk production. So there is little research to support that an increase in water increases the volume of human milk. Um, one thing that you can think of um, in your talks with um, you know, breastfeeding moms and pregnant women, um, just encourage them to think about having a glass of water um, with every meal or snack. They may not need it, but if they kind of train themselves to begin thinking about it, um, at least that will um, you know, let them consider it. Salt. So the body uses sodium to maintain fluid levels. Um, now a balance of fluid and sodium is necessary for the health of the heart, liver, and kidneys. And it regulates blood fluids and prevents low blood pressure. The American diet is typically high in sodium, and so no supplementation is needed, even though during pregnancy a woman's blood volume can increase by more than 40% just to meet prenatal prenatal demands. The American diet is typically high in sodium, and no supplementation is needed, even though during pregnancy a woman's blood volume can increase by more than 40%. Now let's take a look at whole grains. All grains start life as whole grains. In their natural state, growing in the fields, whole grains are the entire seed of a plant. This seed, also called a kernel, is made up of three edible parts, the bran, the germ, and the endosperm. We talked a little bit about this when we were discussing fiber earlier. So these three edible parts are protected by an inedible husk that protects the kernel from assaults by sunlight, pests, water, and disease. Now a grain is considered to be a whole grain as long as all three original parts, the bran, the germ, and the endosperm, are still present in the same proportions as when the grain was growing in the fields. Now we talked about this just a couple of uh, moments ago. Constipation can be a common complication of pregnancy, uh, either by itself or due to the influence of um, an iron supplement. So fiber found in whole grains along with other foods like fruits, veggies, beans, and legumes can assist with alleviating that condition. Total dietary fiber should be around 25 to 30 grams a day from food and not supplements. Currently, dietary fiber intakes among adults in the U.S. average about 15 grams a day, so it's about half of the recommended amount. So I'm going to start off this section by actually summarizing what the goal of the choosemyplate.gov campaign is. And you know, it's simply this, that half of your plate should be fruits and veggies. That means that you're not eating a diet that is super high in saturated fats or added sugars. Um, There's not a lot of added sodium and you're getting a lot of fiber. There's a wide variety of vitamins and minerals and you're not having a really calorically dense um, diet. So again, this is kind of the summary of what we'll be talking about. If you remember this simple principle when you're discussing um, you know, nutrition with your clients, it's pretty easy to remember and the rest of the guidelines kind of follow this. So we've all heard about um, portion distortion and the American diet. Often it's not only that the content of the American diet is high in empty calories, high in saturated fats, added sugars, etc. It's also that our portion sizes are a little out of control. So what I'm going to do here is just quickly go over some food group equivalents. Um, And again, these are the general portion sizes of most foods, and there are some exceptions to um, what we're going to be talking about. But again, most of um, what I'm going to be showing you is easy to remember, and it can be used just by using your hand. So basically, one cup of fruits, which is a serving size, um, counts as a cup of raw or cooked fruit, 
half a cup of dried fruit is a serving size or a cup of 100% fruit juice. And just a note about fruit juice, really it's always better to enjoy the entire or the fresh or raw or cooked um, fruit or vegetable instead of just the juice. You tend to get more fiber when you are eating the in, you know the whole fruit or vegetable. And you're also enjoying the fruit or vegetable in its natural state where the nutrients are in good combination with each other. Whereas in a fruit juice, it really is just sugar water with some of the vitamins and minerals from that fruit or vegetable. So again, I really recommend no more than one cup of fruit juice a day, if even that. Uh, count fruit juice as a food, um, if you'll think about it. So remember, fruit juice has calories. And if you are drinking uh, one cup or two cups or three cups of juice a day, um, those calories can add up really quickly. So again, we just want to make sure that um, you know, water is the preferred beverage. Um, just kind of think water for thirst and remember to count fruit juice as a serving. And again, um, just going back to, just keep in mind that the size of most um, adult closed fists are about one cup. And so that can be um, a guideline for you uh, in terms of how much fruit to eat. But again, you know, fruit is one of those food groups. If you overdo it a little bit with fruit or you overdo it a little bit with veggies, you know, it, that's not that big of a consequence just because these groups just tend to not have um, as many calories. It's an adult hand, a clenched fist. One cup of vegetables counts as one cup of raw or cooked veggies, two cups of leafy salad greens, and again, one cup of 100% vegetable juice. So when you look at the carbohydrate group, um, one slice of bread is about one portion size, one ounce of ready-to-eat cereal, or a half a cup of cooked rice, pasta, or cereal. And so the front of your fist is about a half a cup, which is about a serving size. And as you can see, that's not a lot, but it does really um, go along with the or choosemyplate.gov um, sample of the half of your plate being fruits and veggies and that small quarter corner of the plate being uh, your grains. And again, so keep in mind that this is one food group that is, uh, that is easy to overdo. So for dairy, one cup of dairy is a serving size and it can be one cup of milk, a cup of yogurt, uh, or a cup of fortified soy beverage. Cheeses, is, this is one area that it's uh, easy to overdo as well. So one and a half ounces of natural cheeses or two ounces of processed cheese is also one serving. And so for example, a slice of cheese, that's one serving right there. And that's easy to eat and consume really quickly. Uh, you eat, you know, two servings. Again, very easy to overdo. So keep in mind that two ounces, which is, you know, your processed cheese, that's about two full fingers. One ounce is roughly, um, you know, the size of your thumb. So again, between, you know, two fingers and your thumb, um, that would be about one serving of a natural cheese. So for protein, one ounce of protein counts as one serving size. Uh, that would be one ounce of lean meat, poultry, or seafood. Um, an egg would cons uh, be considered to be one serving. Um, one tablespoon of peanut butter, a quarter cup of cooked beans or peas, or one half ounce of nuts or seeds. Um, and again, remember the nuts and the seeds, they're a great, great food, very nutrient dense, but uh, they are very calorically dense. And so you wanna watch the portion size on that as well. Again, portion control is important. And it is as simple as using your hand. So, you know, just keep what we um, talked about in mind um, because, again, it is easy to um, fall into the trap of portion distortion, like, you know, with the plate of spaghetti that's, that's on the slide there. Um, you know, that would be a typical serving at, you know, any popular Italian restaurant. I think that's a lot of times what people um, expect. But as you can see, that's more than a day's worth um, just in that one plate. This is a sample menu based on approximately 2,200 total calories for the day. Going through breakfast, you know, a morning snack, a lunch, a salad, um, as you can see, um, this is a pretty well-balanced diet. There's a lot of variety. The dietary guidelines are not a specific set of do's and don'ts, um, but they are important because people really don't eat foods and nutrients in isolation. What really matters is the big picture their diet over time. It really is important to look at how a person's food and beverage choices add up over 
weeks, and months, and years. We know that eating patterns have a significant impact on health, and diet is one of the most powerful tools we have to reduce the onset of disease. Healthy eating patterns can help prevent obesity, heart disease, high blood pressure, and type 2 diabetes. Currently, about half of all American adults have one or more of these diet-related chronic diseases. Now, healthy eating patterns are adaptable. When people follow a healthy eating pattern, they can incorporate many of the foods that they enjoy. Healthy eating patterns can work for anyone, accommodating their traditions, their culture, and their budget. There are many paths to a healthy eating pattern. The Dietary Guidelines provides examples of three eating patterns. There's the healthy U.S. style, the healthy Mediterranean style, and the healthy vegetarian eating pattern. The Dietary Guidelines gives clear recommendations and suggestions about how to follow a healthy eating pattern. And by definition, healthy eating patterns need to stay within appropriate calorie limits for a person's age, gender, and activity level, meet their nutritional needs, and be achievable and maintainable in the long term. One important way of achieving, and more importantly maintaining, a healthy eating pattern is to choose a variety of nutrient-dense foods across all food groups. A healthy eating pattern includes nutrient-dense forms of a variety of veggies, dark greens, reds, oranges, as well as legumes such as beans and peas and starchy and other veggies, fruits, especially whole fruits, grains, at least half of which are whole grains, fat-free or low-fat dairy including milk, yogurt, cheese, and fortified soy beverages, a variety of protein foods including seafood, lean meats and poultry, eggs, legumes such as again beans and peas, soy products and nuts and seeds, and oils, including those from plants, such as canola, corn, olive, peanut, safflower, soybean, and sunflower oils, and oils that are also naturally present in foods, such as those found in nuts, seeds, seafood, olives, and avocados. Note that these foods are only nutrient-dense if they're prepared with little or no added solid fats, sugars, refined starches, and sodium. Now, did you know that almost 50% of all added sugars in the American diet are in drinks? Like soft drinks, fruit drinks, and energy drinks. When we're looking at limiting calories from added sugars, you want to limit those to less than 10% of your total calories a day. When you're looking at limiting calories from saturated and trans fats, again, you want to limit saturated fats to less than 10% of total calories daily. Sodium, you want to limit that to less than 2,300 milligrams each day. And with alcohol, you want to limit that to no more than one drink daily for women and no more than two a day for men. And keep in mind that there is no uh, safe level for alcohol during pregnancy. Remember that soda, and sugary drinks are a very sneaky source of added sugar. Non-diet sodas contain a sweetener, often high fructose corn syrup, and it's right there on the label, easy to see. It's usually one of the first ingredients listed. Now, 12 ounces of a regular soda can pack 39 grams of carbs, all coming from sugar. That's like adding 22 packets of sugar into a glass of water. Choosing soda is essentially drinking sugar, it's a major, major reason why Americans are overweight, and it's also a ridiculously easy change to make. Just think if you have 100 extra calories each day. 100 extra calories each day, whether it be from an extra pad of butter or a sugary drink, that adds up to 10 pounds a year. If you look at 100 calories a day times seven days a week, that's 700 calories a week extra. If you multiply 700 calories a week times 52 weeks a year, you're getting over 35,000 extra calories. With 3,500 calories equaling one pound, that 35,000 extra calories a year equals 10 pounds. You do that for um, a year or two or three, that can really add up. And that is something to really consider and it's something that I emphasize to um, our patients and our clients. So keeping in mind that if you can blow it by 100 calories a day and gain 10 pounds, 
you can also easily make that change and redeem it by decreasing your intake by 100 calories or more a day and improve or at least maintain. And again, one of the easiest ways to do that is if someone is drinking a sugary beverage to just switch that out to either like a plain water um, or like mineral water, brewed tea, or um, a diet soda. Quickly loading up on added sugars is easy if you're not careful about what you stir into your hot drink or put on your oatmeal. And again, we're in a Starbucks um, you know, world right now, and even the uh, drinks that are available at Starbucks, some of those have the equivalent calories of a meal. And the concept of healthy shifts make dietary change tangible and you know less overwhelming. So by helping people focus on small improvements, eating healthy may seem more manageable. Americans make so many choices every day about what to eat and drink that to help them see each choice as an opportunity to make small and healthy changes is a really good thing. So for example, some easy, easy switches are um, switching a full fat cheese or whole milk to a low fat or non-fat cheese or milk, choosing whole wheat bread over white bread, or um, switching fatty cuts of meat out for seafood or even beans, changing from butter to olive or canola oil or you know, like I mentioned earlier, even um, avocado on toast is a better alternative than just butter. Switching soft drinks to water or brewed tea, and even switching over potato chips to unsalted nuts, even though, again, you do need to watch um, the portion size. And finally, professionals can work together with support from the public to put the dietary guidelines into action around the nation. And no matter what your field of work or your area of expertise, you can help bring about um, healthy changes. And this is where my current work in Champions for Change at Northeast Valley Health Corporation comes into play. And again, we are just looking to make the healthy choice the easy choice for today's family. And the Maryland Magrum Center at CSUN is also a Champions for Change program, making a difference um, in the western part of the San Fernando Valley. And again, everyone has a role. So at home, at schools, at workplaces, in communities, food retail outlets. Encouraging easy, accessible, and affordable ways to support healthy choices is important no matter what profession you end up pursuing. At home, for example, families can try out small changes to find what works for them, like adding more veggies to favorite dishes, um, to adding more veggies into soups or even into sandwiches. Um, having children choose a favorite veggie to serve the family each week having families plan meals and cooking at home, and also ensuring that there's physical activity time. Now, schools can also help improve the selection of healthy food choices in cafeterias and vending machines. Um, they can provide nutrition ed programs as well as school gardens. Uh, they can increase school-based physical activity and encourage parents and caregivers to promote healthy changes at home. Workplaces can encourage walking or activity breaks. Um, they can offer healthy food options in the cafeteria and in vending machines. Um, we can also ensure that healthy food options are available for staff meetings or functions. And health and wellness programs and nutrition counseling um, can often be made available in the workplace. Communities can also increase access to affordable, healthy food choices through community gardens, farmers markets, shelters, and food banks, as well as create walkable communities by maintaining safe public spaces. So again, there are many, many different opportunities to really help make the healthy choice the easy choice for today's family. Really being able to read a food label is critical to understanding exactly what you are eating. And this is just going to be a crash course. Um, for full disclosure, this is just for your info only and um, this won't be included on the evaluation of the test. So this is just um, for your benefit um, and your knowledge only. I've circled the serving size section and that shows how many servings are in the package and how big the serving is. Serving sizes are given in familiar measurements such as cups or pieces. All of the nutrition information on the label is based on one serving of food. A package of food can often contain more than one serving and you really need to carefully look to see how many servings are in the bag. If you look at a serving size and it says 100 calories per serving and you don't see that there's two and a half servings per package and you eat the whole package, you're not getting 100 calories. You're getting 100 times 2.5, which is a lot higher. So again, and again, amount of calories. 
The calories listed are for one serving of the food. In this label, there are two servings. If you had the whole box or package, which isn't an uncommon thing to do, you would need to double the calories. Fats. These are not listed on all of the new food labels. Um, some still do, some don't, but it does still itemize what percentage of daily value comes from fat. It also lists the type of fat. Now keep in mind a product that's fat free is not necessarily calorie free. The calories can come from plenty of other sources. You just again need to read the label. Percent daily value. The percent daily value is a general guide to help you link nutrients in one serving to the contribution to your total daily diet. It can help you determine if a food is high or low in a nutrient. 5% 5 or less is considered low and 20% or more is considered high. You can use the percent daily value to make dietary trade-offs with other foods throughout the day. So for example, if you are looking for a nutrient um, like fiber, if you see that it is high in the percent daily value, that's good. But if you're trying to limit your saturated fats, you want that value to be low, 5%. Once you are familiar with percent daily value, you can use it to compare foods and decide which is the better choice for you. Be sure to check for the particular nutrients you want more of or less of. Using percent daily value information can also help you balance things out for the day. So for example, if you ate a favorite food at lunch that was high in sodium, one of those nutrients that you want to get less of, you would then try to choose foods for dinner that are lower in sodium. And again, if you realize that you really didn't have a lot of fiber throughout the day, then you could use the food label as a way to identify foods that are higher in fiber for uh, your meals later on. So the nutrients that you want to get more of are calcium, dietary fiber, potassium, vitamin A, and vitamin C. Now Americans don't often get enough of these nutrients. And these are essential, as we talked about earlier, for keeping you strong and healthy. Now you want to limit these following nutrients. Too much total fat, especially saturated fat and trans fat, cholesterol, and sodium may increase your risk of certain chronic diseases, such as heart disease, cancers, or even high blood pressure. The food labels also now list added sugars, and they're listed prominently, so it's easier to identify what really is in those packages. And again, added sugars, that's another uh, one of those uh, food items that you want to um, reduce. Have you ever bought a package of food because the food label said the item was low sodium or low fat or, or made some other claim? It's important to understand what these claims mean so that you can make informed decisions about the food that you buy for yourself and your family. And nutritional claims are now more standardized. There are uniform definitions for terms that describe a food's nutrient content, such as light, low fat, and high fiber. And to ensure that such terms mean the same for any product on which they appear, um, again, they're now standardized. You can go on to the choose myplate.gov website for complete definitions of all of these um, new claims and for even more information on food labeling. So if, like many Americans, you stock your pantry with processed foods, you may worry about how safe food additives really are. So food additives simply serve to color food, enhance flavor, and or preserve freshness. And they can keep our food safer and even improve texture. Some are synthetic, while others come from minerals, plants, and animals. Now, natural additives are not all healthy, and synthetic additives are not all harmful. And while some changes improve quality, some may even alter the nutritional value of the product. And over the years, the safety of many food additives, from food dyes to sugar substitutes to high fructose corn syrup, even to trans fats, has come into question. A scare over a food additive may linger in our minds long after researchers find there's actually no cause for alarm. It can take years or even decades to find out the truth, and sometimes the case is never really closed, at least in our minds. For the majority of people, the takeaway today is all foods can fit. Just look for balance, variety, and moderation in what you choose to eat. Keep in mind that small shifts, small measurable changes, are easier for most clients to make. And being successful at one small change can often help you be more successful at bigger changes. 
In the slides following, I have included a number of quality, reliable resources for you to refer to, from governmental agencies to journals to universities, consumer groups, professional organizations, and volunteer groups. There are many places to obtain dependable info. Pregnancy and lactation are milestones in a woman's life, and she may be more receptive to nutrition education. And being a positive influencer by being ready with sound nutrition suggestions will benefit mom, baby, and the entire family, hopefully for generations to come. Again, specific, small, practical suggestions go a long way towards success, and that one victory can often lead to another. Referring to a registered dietitian nutritionist or degree nutritionist is recommended when faced with any medical, health, or strict dietary issues. And as mentioned earlier, the goal of nutrition during pregnancy and lactation is optimal outcomes for mom and baby. Helping baby develop and grow well while assisting mom in maintaining or obtaining good health themselves. Thank you.